Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. In today's episode, we are back with another installment of the Muscle Group series. In this series, we take a deep dive on specific muscles. In each episode, you're going to learn function of the muscle, common training mistakes, misconceptions about that muscle group, go-to exercises, and why we program them for our clients. We'll also talk about key execution cues to nail down technique. And in today's episode, we're actually going to cover the glutes. We're going to mainly talk about the glute max, as it's the largest one and the one you're probably most used to hearing about. But we're also going to touch on the smaller glute muscles that make up the glute trio, such as the glute minimus and glute medius. So note, I want to preface really quickly as we do at the front end of each one of these episodes, and that's we're not here to exhaust every bit of the anatomical structure or explanation. We're here to basically give you the tools to better understand the anatomy to use with an application in your training, right? So how do we create better training sessions, um, more intelligent program design with this anatomy knowledge? That's what we're here to do. So I'm going to hand it over to Sue. Uh, we'll get us started here today talking about glutes. Yeah. Well, first off, I'll start by saying I really don't like training glutes. Uh, but the reason while it's a positive to train glutes, not only for the aesthetic benefits, but the glutes are going to act as key players in hip stability and strength during activities like walking, jumping, sprinting and strength training. So the glute, um, the gluteus maximus, medius and minimus help the hip extend externally and internally rotate and abduct. Um, so a B duct. So moving the thigh away from the body and strong and functional glutes can help alleviate lower back pain and make everyday movements like standing, walking, climbing the stairs that much easier. Um, so it is something where I know when I was training my dad in person, when I did used to train in person, um, it was something that he was very thrown off when I had him doing glute movements. Um, and he was like, I'm not trying to build a booty and have this whole glute situation going on. Um, and I was like, this is for stability in your pelvis as you age, um, because it can cause a lot of issues if you don't have those muscles um, kind of all set to go. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Alex as we break down um, the glute muscles that like I talked about the maximus, medius and minimus um, to just be able to give a little bit of a refresher on what that looks like within training in life. Yeah. And I think that before we move on to the anatomy aspect of things from a, a male perspective, uh, where Sue is speaking on her dad, not wanting to you know, grow his glutes specifically. Well, with a, a lot of individuals, as they get into adulthood, they're going to be sitting at a desk sitting very, very frequently. So the glutes are going to atrophy, uh, pretty easily with the amount of time that you're sitting on them, um, which is going to cause the issues that, you know, Sue kind of alluded to within overall, just pelvic stability um, and, and ability to walk and, and uh, you know general daily tasks that you kind of take for granted um, and it looks a little off when individuals have like this board structure um, <laughs> to their to their lower half and like they they can't even like keep their pants up because their glutes are so small so in this when your facet, low back hits your hamstrings you're you're in trouble you've got a problem listen that used yeah. to be me in high school, <laughs> truthfully. There are pictures, and I went from my lower back straight to my legs. There's I'm nothing sorry. there. <laughs> it's quite unfortunate. So you're going to like your appearance probably a little bit more and the functionality and strength if you uh, do focus on a little bit of glute training. It doesn't have to have like its full dedicated day, but you're going to uh, benefit greatly, uh, and, and it plays such a key role in uh, so many different uh, movements and things of that nature. So, and clothes fitting better. Yeah clothes fitting better, all now, those things. females, I will say that if your dresses start to feel a little bit short, that happened to me as my shoulders and glutes grew. I tried on all these dresses and I was like, oh my gosh, why do none of these fit? I was definitely not wearing something this short. And then I kind of thought about it and realized that my shoulders had grown and so had my glutes. So it kind of picked the dress up and pushed it out and my dress has gotten a little shorter. So if you're recognizing that and you know how to properly wash your clothes and you're not shrinking them, then that's a, a win a lot of those clothes but definitely a win that's my problem i've been wondering what why my dresses fit differently Damn it. I, I knew you would that's so the secret you're welcome 
<laughs> Man, so the the first muscle we're going to talk about today is the glute max. This is the the often uh, talked about tissue that that many of you are, are wanting to train and, and grow specifically. So this is going to be the largest, as the name alludes to, being the max. Um, we have the the three different muscle groups: the the medius and the minimus as well. Uh, but the glute max itself is going to uh, be responsible for the movement of the hip and thigh, mainly known for its role in hip extension. So when we speak on hip extension, think about movements such as the RDL, think about movements such as the back squat and the hip thrust and the glute bridge. All these movements are going to have the glute max as a, a primary mover um, through the, the main range of motion in those specifically. You guys have anything to add on glute max? No. <laughs> I'll add, I'll just add, uh, you know, based off based off of kind of what we've been, been talking about, you know, we mentioned in the beginning uh, when Sue was mentioning about uh, just daily activities, of daily living, those, those amazing ADLs we learned about in college, if, or if you talk, took an ACSM class or NASM or whatever acronym you took, um, essentially, you know, we're talking about the glute max as a, as a major player in life, right? So in life it's used for standing, uh, standing up from a sitting position, climbing stairs, staying in erect, or upright position. Um, and again, the glute max is such a, a big glute muscle, uh, being one of the greatest uh, contributors to the shape of the buttocks itself. So again, if you don't want a uh, quote unquote pancake board and or your low back to hit your hamstrings, then you need to train or use movements that train the glutes. Um, and this was really just a fun fact that I wanted to, to mention um, but it is uh, theorized that the glute max heavily evolved, um, you know, a while back from our ancestors, uh, Homo erectus, um, which just means upright man, um, as we are Homo sapiens, if you didn't know, uh, a, a distant cousin uh, relative to distant relative to this this Homo erectus. Um, but this newfound ability, essentially, that we we had and gained of running and uh, running long distances and in short bursts. Uh, to essentially stay alive, right? So it helps the the big glute muscle helped us um, in a very powerful way and helped us keep our hips stable while we were running, helps us keep us upright and propelling us forward again, aka alive and hopefully getting some food, which then led to us, right? So I thought that was a really cool fact um, because if you look at uh, some of our other distant cousins and and other development there, they have very small glute maxes. Um, so it's kind of a, an, a question of like, when did this really become like a big thing for us? Um, and it really became when we became more upright. Um, that was my own little fun fact there. So we can continue with the, uh, the other, um, the other muscles, uh, of the, the lower half. Yes. Uh, so the, the next portion of the glute that we're going to speak on is the uh, glute medius. And so when we when we think of this, just to give you guys a visual, uh, the glute max is going to be that beautiful tissue in the back pose for any of the competitors that are listening that you see within, uh, well, female or, or male competitors when they hit their back shot, that's going to, um, for those who are fortunate enough to have it insert halfway down their leg, <laughs> you see this insertion point that uh, kind of gives it kind of a, a diamond shape or or individuals will call it the glute ham tie-in where it's literally just the insertion point of the glute itself. Um, so that's the, the glute max and, and the, the insertion point of that. The glute medius is actually going to run on the, the side. It is going to be a, a fan shape um, musculature. And so to train this tissue is going to be different. But um, in terms of visual, what this tissue is going to provide you is that shelf-like appearance to the upper portion or outer upper outer portion of your glute to to give you more width to your glutes to shrink your waist so <clears throat> being able to train the glute medius um well is going to pay huge dividends for you from an aesthetic uh, perspective of course from a, a functional standpoint as well um so with the the glute medius it is it is broad and it is thick and converges from its origins on the pelvis down to its insertion point on the upper leg um, which is going to be the femur that is going to be a very well written piece by by austin himself um 
<laughs> within the specifics of the um, insertion point for that specific tissue. And so from an actions perspective, it is going to allow for you to AB duct um, the, the upper leg and allow for you to medially and laterally rotate the leg itself. Um, so that is kind of the, the general gist of the, the glute medius. Uh, specifically, it's a tissue that's harder to train, uh, but we've had some great success with clients here at Physique Development, and it has truly changed some physiques by being able to create greater density um, and utilization of this tissue specifically. Yeah, and this is also going to be the tissue that helps study the pelvis when you only have one foot on the ground, whether that's with running or if you're balancing or if you're doing a, a kickback and you have one leg on the ground. Um, but it's also something, and Alex alluded to it, of saying the upper glute. If you ever hear someone make a comment of like, oh, this is to target your upper glute or this is to ta target your side glute um, or your lower glute, those are not anatomically correct or just correct in general. Um, so being able to kind of know what muscle this is working instead of just referring to it as, oh, this is my upper glute um, and being able to realize, hey, this is my glute med. Um, this is kind of what's doing it. This is what exercises. These are what exercises are going to be able to help me grow this are all going to be extremely beneficial um, to be able to understand that. Um, to build on that, uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit about exercises, but I, I think we can integrate, uh, some of that talk now, if we, if we could, or wanted to, um, what are some of like the, the few builders that you've been using with your competitors to build up the, the glute need more specifically? Um, so what, what we've been doing the most has been the, the modified curtsy lunge, uh, the back foot elevated modified curtsy lunge. We've seen some really good success within that movement. Um, how the, uh, the fibers line up in that specifically, we found that this is a really great lengthened exercise. So as you guys have been paying it, uh, paying attention to all these episodes, when we talk about lengthened and, and shortened positions of the tissue, uh, with the lengthened position, that's the, the insertion and the origin of the, the target tissue being as far away from one another as possible. What we know from research within that is that this is going to give us the greatest uh, degree of hypertrophy when we are training under great loads, um, in this length specifically. So we've seen some really great strides there. Um, also in the shortened range, um, we've been utilizing a glute medius kickback, which is going to be utilizing a, a cable kickback or an ankle, um, uh, ankle attachment with a cable, allowing for you to kick back in more of a 45 degree angle. It is certainly a, a very, um, advanced movement because of the level of difficulty to target such a small tissue uh, or muscle group specifically. But once you're able to uh, find the the line of pull for you and, and positioning, it's it's very, very successful to get the, the glute medius in a shortened range. Um, one thing that clients have run into, and we'll kind of talk about this in the, the next portion of the glute uh, minimus, but Within that, they're, they're getting a very large burning sensation in the opposing leg um, where they're like, man, I'm getting a lot of sensation on my other leg. Well, you're one, you're standing on, on one limb. And, and so that's obviously going to really uh, stress the stabilizers on that side. But also the, the glute minimus on the opposing leg is going to be doing a great deal of stabilization where if you're doing repetitions of maybe 10 to 12, hell yeah, that, that stabilizer is going to be burning a little bit during that set. So when you are alternating legs on the, the kickbacks, give yourself a little bit of time because the, the glute minimus on the opposing leg is doing a great deal of work just to keep the uh, pelvis in a stable position and, and those different factors. Yeah. Keep the femur within your hip joint as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the important that might things. be helpful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a helpful one. Um, so helpful that, that one. force, that force working outward there, definitely you're going to be like, damn, that's burning. Why is it burning? It's like, well, it's either that or the femur skyrockets laterally out of your hip. Um, so, <laughs> um, probably not literally, but it, it's on its way. If that, if that doesn't, if that fails us essentially. So again, kind of going back to the, some of that, uh, nomenclature around function there. I mean, we're talking a lot about stability within this uh, glute minimus, glute medius, uh, glute medius is a bigger muscle all around of the smaller glute muscles. Um, the minimus, again, as we kind of mentioned, and Alex alluded to in the beginning, it's, it's really pretty much there as, uh, a, a stabilizer, uh, of the hip and to keep that hip and pelvis stable. Um, especially when there's your foot is planted and there are lateral forces, um, think about side to side forces on the hip. 
Um, and, and again, it's kind of keeping everything there and, and together. Um, think of it kind of like uh, what your delts do in a deadlift. Um, so like, obviously there's not an outward, you know, you're not lateral raising a barbell, but your, your delts are keeping if you're, I mean, if you are good for you, um, <laughs> but <laughs> I'd love to see it. Um, but essentially your, your delts are, are playing a prime role in, in keeping again, your, the femur of your upper arm, the humerus, the, the upper arm bone in your shoulder. Um, so it's helping stabilize that, that big structure up there at the shoulder similar to what your glute minimus is doing um, there at the hip in a, in a large way. It's a, hopefully that's a helpful analogy for you to kind of visualize what's happening there a little bit more, but yeah, that's all I got. Yeah. I mean, there's the, the I guess to, to build off of the things that you already said with the minimus is that it's going to be the, the deepest and the most superficial portion of the glute itself. And, um, that's really all that we need to touch on a whole lot. It's not going to be something that you're, you're targeting as a, a main muscle group. Um, it, like, like Austin said, it's going to be more of a stabilizer than anything. Yeah. What do we think about, um, what do we think about the, uh, the, I know we're gonna get questions on this or we've definitely seen this, um, the sort of like the monster walks, the band walks, um, things like that more as like a, a use for burning out the glutes. Uh, if you will. I mean, what do we, what do we think about that? I know it's <clears throat> very popular to band around the knees is what Austin is specifically referring to and either doing walks laterally um, or having that band around your knees for hip thrusts or for squats. Um, I'll let Alex kind of go into a few more of the nuances of this, but what I will say is that a light band not an insane glute band that is a ton of tension. A light band can be very helpful if you are a beginner and learning how to squat and to hip thrust and needing that cue for yourself. It is not something that I personally, and you guys can weigh on this, um, like to program within clients of having it around their knee because it can cause dysfunction. Um, but it is something that I don't like to say, never put a band around your knee because I do find that it does have benefits in regards to learning. And especially if you are training someone in person and can truly keep your eyes on what they're doing, why they're doing it, and being able to have that as a proper cue for them. Them, but it's not something in my eyes that needs to be used continuously because it can cause further dis, um, dysfunction instead of the help that it might be um, having at the beginning. Yeah, I, I think that the the largest um, use of it could be from like a prehab or a rehab standpoint. It's not something that we use in our program design at, uh, much at all. Um, if at all. And so I, I think that many people get into the, it, there's a lot of sensation that, that transpires when utilizing them. There's an e it's very easy to uh, attain a, a burning sensation when utilizing the bands, especially at some of these you know, very uh, thick bands that you're really having to, to generate a lot of force outward um, with the bands themselves. And there's a very, very small muscle group called the, the piriformis that's going to run under um, the, uh, the glute itself. And that's where a lot of that tension is being uh, created more so. And it's a, a muscle group that does not need a whole lot of tension and is not going to be this, you know, you're not going to grow the piriformis so large that it's just going to, um, you know, I guess out strengthen the <laughs> remainder of your <laughs> musculature that's surrounding, uh, the, the upper uh, portion of your lower limb, but that's where a lot of that tension is being created. And then that's where a lot of the dysfunction transpires that that is that it's extremely inflamed. Um, and it is a, it's not recovering well. So then you're, you're having to resort to other stabilizers and having to shift your hips in, in different directions. And it leads Leads, I mean, just down a, a rocky road of, of trying to figure out your glute training as a whole. So um, I, I think that our our work speaks for itself in the sense that we do not use um, any banding at the hip. And you've seen a lot at of, uh, or at the, yeah, at the knees. We, we, do, <laughs> we do band at the standing. hip, sorry, <laughs> at the knees. And I think that our, our work speaks for itself in the sense that we've been able to grow some pretty incredible glutes without doing so. Um, and they're, they're sure, I'm sure there is a, uh, greater application potentially, but I, I find that it's not necessary and there's better ways for us to go about it within our own programming. 
Yeah. And with that band around your knee, it, it, like Alex said, prehab and rehab, because I know I had used that um, and you might ha- use it for like a warm up of, oh, I'm going to do banded clamshells um, or whatever it may be, because I had to do a lot of clamshells when I was rehabbing from a back injury and being able to have that in place. So it's not that they have zero benefit whatsoever. It's just not a ton of benefit when it comes to like growing glutes specifically for making sure everything's functioning good, but we don't want to use it to the point that it has the dysfunction. But on the same note of dysfunction, I thought before we went into exercises and common mistakes, um, this kind of fits into it a little bit, but you might not be seeing your glutes grow because you might have an interior pelvic tilt. And this is something worth mentioning because a lot of people come to us with anterior pelvic tilts, or you just see them on the internet and you're just like, wow, that's quite the anterior pelvic tilt you got going on there. Um, And that can really hinder growth of certain muscle groups because you are overstretching certain muscles and then over lengthening certain muscles. Some things can be very tight. Um, So being able to make sure that your pelvis and your hips are in the correct position. Now that is going to take different exercises to kind of work through it. It's not just going to be like, oh, I'm going to decide not to have an anterior pelvic tilt today. Um, But it is something worth mentioning um, because it it can cause excessive pain on the lower back. And then oftentimes it does, quote, shut off the glutes because you're not having uh, your body functioning in the way that it needs to be. Do you want to explain that a little bit more of what an anterior pelvic tilt is? Yeah. So if you think about your hips, like it's a bucket of water. Um, So just think of instead of a pelvis, you have a bucket of water. (laughs) <laughs> where your pelvis the, the would be. The top of your body and your legs, but you have you just a bucket, have a bucket of, water of water for your <laughs> genitalia and, and abs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. So Imagine, stay, I guess we're living in the SpongeBob world, I think. Bikini yes. bottom is where we're living. Stay, <laughs> stay you're standing normally. Your bucket is filled with water, but it's not tipping over. It's just staying in place. Then if you have an anterior pelvic tilt, what you're picturing is that that bucket is tipping forward and dumping out water. Um, and then if you have the opposite of that, then it's kind of dumping water back. Um, but it is something that uh, a way to look for it is when someone is standing. And uh, I mean, within because we've talked about competitors, you are supposed to pose and walk with an anterior pelvic tilt. Um, but the biggest thing is not staying in that interior, interior, anterior pelvic tilt. As soon as I'm done posing, I literally bring my hips back to neutral. I do some different stretches and I really make sure that I'm focusing on standing neutral and having my posture in a good spot outside of that. So if you are a competitor listening to this, yes, you will have to push yourself into an anterior pelvic tilt. Um, But it is something if you constantly stand in that and try to push your glutes out and you have this huge arch in your lower back, you'll also see, and I have clients that have issues within digestion and within stomach control because it's been pushing out out so long um, as they're standing with that huge that bucket completely tipping forward. So their glutes are up on top as they're standing or pushing out, which then in turn has their stomach pushing out, um, which then can also cause problems at the hip flexors um, and then um, just all through your hamstrings um, as well as you're standing in that position. So if you aren't able to train yourself to go back to that neutral spine um, because you are overstretching different muscle groups, like your, your hamstrings are stretched and then the front of your body is very tight. Um, then that's going to cause dysfunction within movement because those aren't supposed to be extra stretched or extra tight. Think about the kind of a, I guess a good way to visualize this is sort of like the cat, the cat cow in yoga. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't be a cow. Um, <laughs> uh, so like a, the cow is essentially like you're on all fours and you're, you're really just like allowing your your stomach to hang looking upward and allowing your your glutes to essentially come up right so you're like driving that arch in your low back um allowing that stomach to essentially distend um you kind of think how you again gorillas sort of stand like this in a, in a big way as they have very large distended stomachs they have they are in an anterior pelvic tilt most of the time um and we wouldn't say that they have a flattering physique by any means. Um, so it's not something you probably want to stand in all the time. And I know growing up, it's sort of, I know a lot of, uh, this was a typical thing for a lot of uh, gals 
our age growing up where it was like you just kind of stood like that because it kind of i think growing up it kind of like maybe accentuates some features that you want to accentuate <laughs> um you know and then they, they never really correct it sometimes um and you lose a lot of engagement with your abs and and as we as we've talked about a lot uh losing engagement with your abs is, is not necessarily something we're wanting to do right we talk a lot uh, a lot about the engagement of the abs within lat training um within glutes uh, especially you know so if you watch any of our our glute videos on youtube which shameless plug as always we have a youtube playlist for today's episode already on our youtube channel um so you can go check that out but we talk in all of those videos we pretty much talk about abs uh, we talk about engaging the abs keeping the abs engaged um and again we're not crunching as much as just you know uh bracing for impact watch out for the second blow um as as we as michael would say so um yeah, Nate, sorry, well, Alex, I know you're going to say something, but I wanted to kind of mention that uh, I, either poor example, good example, you guys will be the judge, um, and then just about the abs. Yeah. The only thing I was going to add is that I didn't want to present you all with a problem. And now some of you are probably listening and being like, oh, shit, you're looking at all these pictures of yourself. And all of a sudden you've got this anterior pelvic tilt that uh, Sue told you about and you don't know how to fix it. So within that, I would encourage you to sign up with a physique development coach and work one on one. Um, that would be another shameless plug, I suppose. But outside of that, what we would be doing and, and the simple fix to this is going to be strengthening your psoas, which is going to be a, a tissue that is going to run anteriorly. Um, and then also you're going to be strengthening your rec fem. So this is going to be a portion of the quad. So the psoas and the rec fem are going to be, I mean, extremely helpful for you in this situation where you're going to get a lot of relief to some of that lower back pain that you're experiencing and also greater function of the pelvis um, in its entirety. And then also strengthening the abdomen. So the abdomen, the psoas, the rec fem, wow, you're going to see a, a big shift. It's something that we work with on, on a very regular basis, especially working with competitors um, or individuals who are just biasing a lot of, of their training towards glutes and they're not training quads very much at all. And so then they find themselves in this position where they're in this kind of chronic anterior pelvic tilt. There's a simple fix to it. It's just a matter of, of understanding what tissue is pulling where and, and understanding the, the contrasting tissue. Yeah. And depending on how long you've had it is also going to depend on how much work it is to be able to fix it. Um, so if it's something that's just started to come up because you have started to push out your glutes more or started to pose versus you've stood or worked that way. I even have clients that are um, like um, dental hygienists. And so they're in their chair and they're leaning over. And as they're sitting, they're in that interior pelvic tilt. And we were doing all these exercises and it was still so bad. And I was like, walk me through this. Like what's going on throughout the day that is causing this to be exacerbated so much. And we finally had it click of, oh my gosh, I'm doing it while I'm sitting in that chair all day. So it can happen also from sitting in a chair all day, not getting up and moving, not having strong enough glutes. Um, and it's something that on top of what Alex said, really working on your hip flexors and stretching those out because they have been so tight um, throughout you going through having that interior pelvic tilt. And the biggest thing within it, obviously it's not great to stand in that all day and causing that distension at the stomach, but it's also something that if you're doing weighted exercises and loading the spine, when you have that interior pelvic tilt, we see it a lot with RDLs and even more so with squats specifically. If you are in an interior pelvic tilt, meaning you have that extension at your spine, you have that big curve in your spine, not rounded, but you have that curve in your lower back as you're squatting, that can cause even more pain and frustration down the line as you're loading your spine in that extended state. So keeping your spine and core neutral and strong is going to be a safe bet with anything that you want to do. Um, and also so that you can age appropriately um, and not have problems with standing, sitting and walking as those are things that I plan to do as I age at least. Yeah. And keeping just really, I mean, so when we talk about, uh, I think, uh, you know, you hear a lot about neutral spine and it's, it's very, can be very contextual um, to the individual and kind of what their neutral looks like, right? It's similar to like everyone's squat looks a bit different and that's okay. Um, everyone's neutral spine looks a bit different and that's okay. Uh, and depending on kind of what you're doing, a neutral spine may be a little slightly different, uh, slightly deviated, uh, if you will. But the big thing is with if you have and have created a neutral spine, typically means 
there's some checks and balances that have happened, right? Where we're in alignment, um, your abs are engaged, we're, we're in a stable position that does protect and is using surrounding tissues um, in the upper and lower part of your body that is going to protect your spine um, and, and hopefully not lead to further injury. And really the big thing, um, and I know I've mentioned this in a video, uh, I think I can recall specifically with Alex, um, talking about the deadlifts, uh, up on blocks is really just, and, and not cueing, looking straight up when you like RDL or straight up when you deadlift, because it kind of creates vulnerabilities, right? It creates kinks in the chain that can have downstream effects, um, and, and downstream vulnerabilities. And, um, you know, we don't want to, we want to kind of tie up loose ends if we can, and, um, make sure that we're not having too many vulnerabilities in our, in our lifts. Um, especially when they they happen with very high loads, um, like most of these movements that we're going to kind of talk about here next, I, I would imagine. So, um, you know, things like the the squats and and uh, the RDL and stuff like that. Um, you know, you typically load those pretty heavy and put a lot of stress on your spine. So we want to imagine that to be a, a very safe and effective uh, environment for us to train. So. Did we want to go into exercises? Is that where we're going to go? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and say some of my favorite exercises. We're not going to explain these exercises too much just because it's going to be much easier for you to visually see these exercises as that's the reason we have the videos and the playlist linked. Um, so we're just going to go through some of these and then touch on training mistakes. And we might pull an example from these exercises as we go through these training mistakes as well. So I'll say one of my absolute favorite is going to be the leg press, the glute bias leg press. I love of our personal leg press. Um, and so that helps. Uh, but I love the output that I can get with that. And it's such a stable environment, which I really enjoy because I like just being able to push without having to stabilize myself, which is why I very much so dislike hip thrusts and split squats, even though Alex still makes me do them very rude of him. Um, but another favorite is going to be the 45 degree hip extension. Um, favorites of mine. I'm a big split squat guy. I think that for me specifically, uh, whether that be for my, just my limb links and things of that nature, where I find the greatest tension from a glute max perspective is going to be in a, uh, split squat that's biasing the glutes. Um, I really like the RDL as well. So barbell, uh, dumbbell or, or trap bar, however you're applying that, you can uh, band the hip as well. But those would be the, the two main movements for me personally that I like the most being the, the split squat variations as well as the RDL variations. So I'm really just, I just said my favorite two, but I just said about six exercises at <laughs> once. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm the same as Alex in a, in a large way. Um, I have a long torso and really short femurs, short legs. Uh, so I bend very easily and are kind of like, I, I how do I put this? I, I bend down into a squat, like I fold, I should say that, I fold easily into really any hip flexion position. So, you know, squats, lunges, split squats, all of those are very, my limb links aren't incredibly uh, lengthy, if you will. Um, so. You know, there's not a huge distance for me to travel, if you will. Um, so I, I fold down into those positions very easily. So those typically are my favorites because I can leverage a lot of load there. They feel great. Um, so I, I do like the back squat a lot. Um, I'm a big RDL fan. Um, I love the barbell RDL from a standpoint of like a get after it exercise. I really, really like it, but they're again, as we talked about, like maintaining neutral positioning within uh, your spine and, and not creating too many vulnerabilities within your execution. Uh, and I posted this on my, my Instagram story the other day talking about our um, our app programming, uh, the, physique, the training club, the Physique Development Training Club app um, that is coming out very, very soon. So get, keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, but the, the RDL is programmed within that foundations phase that you start with. And uh, I'm currently running through that. And I put on my story essentially like I'm working myself back up in load there because it is such a favorite of mine, but I don't want to be silly. I don't want to be silly in thinking that I just sort of uh, uh, have the right to just go back to the weights I was doing in that exercise previously, right? So I want to be sure I'm in a good position. 
Um, but that is one of my favorites, the RDL. Um, so once I feel comfortable again, I'm going to probably load that one up a bit. Um, and then I love to hate them, but the split squat, man, it, it's one of those where it's one of those that you, I, I dread doing them. I really do. Um, but I, I man, sometimes. do I, f- yeah, like, man, do I feel them? <laughs> I mean, I, and that's not always like the proxy of, of like a great workout as we've talked about with like training to failure and always being sore, but the, the, there is a proxy of like feeling something the way that you feel that it's like, I mean, you're hitting so many different things. You're biasing glutes, you're, you're hitting adductors in that you're hitting some quad in that, um, you know, you're doing so many different things in that movement and, and it, it takes a lot of stabilization. It, to me, it's just an all around really good, stable yet open kind of, uh, movement where you're, you're not locked in a leg press, you're not locked in a hack squat, but you are in a, in a more of a stable environment to just sort of move and, and, and go up and down in a, in a manner where, you know, you create good execution, which again, we have videos on our YouTube playlist. So, um, those are my two favorites by far, um, for glutes, uh, and then trap bar deadlift. I like that a lot too. That's a great one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And some that we didn't mention as our favorites or not favorites um, are going to be uh, the kickback, different variations of that and lunges. And then a step up um, is a great one as well. So um, those will be all linked on the playlist um, since we have videos for them. But we'll go ahead and go into some different mistakes that happen. So since Austin was talking about the squat, I thought that was a good one to kind of touch on. Um, I know people will talk about the hip thrust and be like, oh, but you also need a squat to be able to get glutes. What I will say about the squat is that it is going to advantage different people differently. Um, Like Austin said, it's very easy for him to fold. Um, For me, it's very difficult. Alex might roll his eyes a little bit at that because I like to complain about how hard squatting is for me. But it is very difficult because I have a long torso and long femurs. If you have, like if you look at the best like power lifters or just like weightlifters in general, um, especially for squatting, it's people that are a little bit more stout, um, people that have less distance to travel. Um, it's the same where we talked about in the chest um, of having like shorter arms. So you don't have as much of a distance to travel. Or if you have like your rib cage in more of a barrel position, then again, that bar is traveling less distance. So you're able to lift a heavier weights um, and being able to kind of see what that looks like. I remember specifically at an in one seminar, Um, We had uh, Lindsay there which lifting Lindsay, great to follow on Instagram. She's very tall and lanky type of person. And then we had Stacy, which is Adam's wife, who is a very short and compressed person. Um, More like and me. Had, I think we have the yeah. same <laughs> length legs, honestly. We have the same, yeah, squeeze, the same setting on the leg extension, I want to say. Exactly. Like this, so it's embarrassing. Uh, had them both <laughs> squatting to show how different it is and how it can bias people based on what your limb lengths are and based on what your your bone lengths are, your torso is. It is going to be different for different people, and that's why when you see in our videos, if we are using some um, heel elevation or using something like for um, deadlifts, like I often have to do them from blocks because I don't have the limb lengths for it to advantage me. I'm going out of my active range of motion to pick it up. So we kind of talk through that within videos, but just kind of noting that is important to say, um, as some people might say like, oh, I get a ton of quads from squats, or someone else might say, I get a ton of glutes. Um, You can bias each one, but it is also going to depend on your limb length. But going into that, my main point um, or a common mistake is not hitting Um, the glutes are not training them in the fully lengthened position. Um, So whether that is by bouncing out of the bottom of a squat or not getting to your active range of motion, um, that's going to be uh, something that we see people run into is just not training in that fully lengthened position. Like Alex said, it's used often for hypertrophy and it's hard because you're basically, or you are, you're tearing your muscle fibers for them to grow back stronger. I know many a times when I have been in a leg press and doing that glute focus leg press. There's times where I see videos and I'm like, man, I'm definitely cutting myself short, but I could lift more weight. Um, And then when I get to that full active range of motion, I am in that lengthened position and holding it and not bouncing out.
out of it. Um, and this is why we always slow down movements as well. I'm hitting that fully lengthened and it is a freaking fight to get that leg press back up because I'm getting that to its fully lengthened position. So um, a common mistake is not training in the fully lengthened position. So a good way to change that is to slow down your movements and pause in the lengthened position and realize what your active range of motion is. And another common mistake in line with that is not training in the fully shortened position and being able to get that full tension, which you often see within the hip thrust of people not getting fully shortened or in the 45 degree hip extension, not getting fully shortened. Um, So being able to really make sure you're getting the most bang out of your buck for these exercises instead of just going through the motions, which is what I did for the first few years I trained. Um, And Alex and I have talked about this at length that I trained for a few years and I just kind of moved my body. I moved from point A to point B. And then I I met Alex and I trained for real for a few years um, and really learned more about the muscles. And I've said it before in an episode, but a big limiting factor for me those first few years was a limited knowledge of human anatomy. And the more that I learned, the better that I got. Um, So then it was the few years of when Alex and I first met that I started to actually move with intention and actually be like, oh, this is what it feels like to contract these muscle groups. And then I've had like this surge of like some really great growth that comes from really great programming from Alex and from PD. Um, It also comes from, of course, being on top of other variables. But this is also the hardest that I've trained. And now I've said it many times, it's not your goal to train yourself into the ground and to sideline yourself every time you train, but for certain phases and within the hypertrophy phases that I'm doing, I am pushing mentally and physically and assessing where that active range of motion is and freaking going for it um, and being able to see those strides. So it's something that being able to kind of assess where you are within your fitness journey and taking the steps of not listening to these episodes and being like, now I need to do X, Y, and Z and completely change everything that I'm doing, take some nuggets from this, apply it to your training for a few weeks, then maybe come back, re-listen or re-look at your notes, take a few more nuggets and apply it. But it's not going to be something that you're going to apply after just listening to this or any of the other episodes once and being like, I've got it. My glutes are about to be on freaking fire. Um, It's more so of being able to take these little tidbits, take these nuggets and assess how you're doing your training and see how you can personally get just a little bit better each and every time that you go into the gym. That was pretty long winded for two training mistakes, but I thought it was important to touch on. Alex, you got anything? (laughs) Um, In terms of like uh, mistakes more so, Mm -hmm. I I think that uh, people want to get like too cute with, with uh, glute training because it's, it's cool on Instagram and shit. But I would, I mean, if, if, if you're able to be extremely good in a, a split squat variation or a back squat, so that being one option and you're really good at like an RDL, uh, and then you're really good with a glute bridge or getting those glutes into the fully shortened position. If you're really good at those three movements and you just continue to build and load in all three of those, you could make some pretty crazy strides within your glutes. Um, if you have proper periodization and things of that nature by just those three exercises alone. And I think that, um, people want to get too fancy with it because it is, you know, it's, it's all over Instagram. It's, it's all these different things and, uh, getting a pump and, and, uh, burnouts and all this, um, are, are very popular, but the reality is, is that if you were to get very, very good at those three things, uh, your glutes are going to be, uh, you know, see great improvements. And a prime example, I'm going to shout out Alex for a second um, because he just had a bikini girl win a pro card and the overall at Junior Nats. And if you saw her back shot, whether on Alex's page at the show or on NPC News Online, you saw that Sable's got some glutes and she worked with Alex to be able to get to that point. And they had a very limited list of exercises that they did. They did not get cute with things at all. Um, He often said that if someone wanted some boring training that Sable's training was it um, because she just got really good at those movements and executed and it freaking showed. So wanted a little shout out for Alex as well as a prime example of not getting too cute within your glute training. 
Yeah. And I think that to add on to that, Sable had came or had come to me in a position where her quads were very, like she had very well developed quads and we needed to uh, detrain those. And, and I guess that's becoming a little bit more popular within some of the, the clients that we're, that we're getting. Um, and it's not necessarily that we're directly atrophying the, the quads themselves. We're just training them significantly less. Um, to a point where she got better at a lot of the glute movements that we were doing to where her quads were not being involved with a lot of the movements that she was thinking were glutes. And and then it was becoming a lot of quad things like a full range of motion hip thrust where she was going from the floor and being extremely aggressive within the, the hip drive where a lot of that is going to be her, her lower back and her quads actually handling that. And then at the very last little bit, she was getting some glute but she wasn't really staying there long enough to even really create much tension. It was like, okay, I'm here. And then it's just fall back down for the, the eccentric. Whereas we got her to a point where we were having great control through, um, I mean, the way that we teach the, the glute bridge and, and the hip thrust is kind of like a middle ground, um, within the two. I don't think that we teach like the very, very specific hip thrust and we don't teach the very, very specific glute bridge. I would say that from a physique development perspective, we're kind of in the middle ground where if you were to categorize the glute bridge, it's, it's keeping the knee and the ankle joint in alignment the entire time. And so it's a very short range of motion at the hip where you're just going into a, you're allowing the glutes to fall to a small degree until the the knees are about to shift. And then you, you're driving back up uh, to the fully shortened position of the glutes. And whereas the, the hip thrust is going to be going all the way to the, to the floor and aggressively driving up to where, um, where we are teaching it is kind of allowing for the knees to drift about 15 to 20 degrees behind the ankle joint and allowing for the tension to still be placed on the the glutes but we're not going all the way to the the bottom so it's kind of like a a middle ground and i find that that's the the best uh, amongst the the ways of um you know getting the best bang for our buck within that movement specifically but i don't really have a good name for it because it's kind of like this is the way that physique development teaches a hip thrust glute bridge thing <laughs> yeah i don't know if it needs a name you know it's just kind of like i think just watch some of our videos and start to apply <laughs> it what and it is you start to apply it, you know, um, but yeah. with that, you know, to add on to what, you know, you were saying, it's, uh, you got to find what works for you. Um, and you, you find what works for you, find what you can create good, um, you know, a significant amount of tension in, and what's going to be advantageous for growth for you, depending on what you're wanting to work on and you hammer at home. Right. And I think that was, you know, uh, displayed within Sable and, uh, what she was able to do and what you guys were able to do there, um, in a large way. So again, I, I think it's important within this be seen, uh, engagement culture that you can, you know, have your own marketing and engagement based social media profile, but understand that your training shouldn't be for engagement. Your training should be, uh, for you. Right. Um, so if you want to do separate training, to for your social media if you have goals similar um then do that but your main training should not be what you're doing to get that you're you know if you're doing the, the that sort of engagement stuff right you're like i have to do it because that's engagement and it's like i respect the game um but understand that like that's not where your best growth is going to come from that's not where your your best training is going to come from so if you had to do that at the end or separate go for it you know um but understand that you got to take ownership of kind of those things you got to take ownership of. And, and one of those things is really good exercise selection and, and really good periodization where you're not training glutes every day, you're allowing them to recover. Um, and then you're, you're, you know, allocating volume in a strategic way that allows for growth in the right places. And it allows for other things to sort of reshape themselves to not atrophy to the point of being weak, but, but, um, maybe shift in, in their, uh, you know, bias, if you will, to similar to what Alex was talking about with, you know, bringing down your quads to bring up your glutes and hams. If you have like monstrous quads, right. Um, as a female, right. As a female competitor, it's not necessarily what you want, especially if it's a bikini competitor. Right. So there are strategic ways to do that. And that's something that I think we do great. So, uh, yeah. Do we have anything else we wanted to, to add on top of any of, of what we covered 
Uh, yeah, just two last mistakes, and I'll just kind of talk on these um, as the extension at the spine rather than the hip. Um, now, some flexion is okay, um, like within a 45 degree hip extension, if you're not having a heavy load moving with that. Um, and then another mistake is going to be uh, just not properly setting it up, which could be for any exercise or any muscle group, but then also too wide of a stance. I know sometimes people think, oh, sumo squats or sumo deadlifts are more or glutes. Um, so I should do it that way. But when you go too wide of a stance, again, you're thinking your, your glutes are keeping your pelvis in line. If you kind of externally rotate too much, then you're not fully getting your glutes involved within that movement. Um, so it's something just worth noting. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to note, which isn't necessarily a common training mistake, but just something I wanted to say, I know we've talked about a lot that you can't train muscle groups in isolation, but you can't train hip extension without both using the glutes and hamstrings, but you can bias one over the other. So if you're like, well, some of these exercises I feel are more hamstring based or I feel in my hamstrings and my glutes, that's going to happen because a lot of these are hip extension um, exercises or work within a hip extension. Um, so that's basically all I had. Um, I didn't know, Alex, if you wanted to touch a little bit on supersets for unilateral versus bilateral um, or save that for another day. We'll save that for another day. All righty. <laughs> well, thanks for learning about growing your glutes. I hope that you learned something, pulled a nugget out, um, and were able to apply this to your training. Um, like we've mentioned, the playlist is linked. And then if you have any feedback for us, there's also a feedback form linked um, as well. But we hope you're enjoying this muscle series, and we'll see you in the next one.